According to the Wall Street Journal, since Disney acquired Marvel in 2009, the studio has produced 25 superhero films that have grossed a total of $25 billion worldwide, making it one of the highest earning film studios in Hollywood history. Among them are Marvel's 2019 Avengers Endgame, which is the highest grossing movie of all time, with $2.8 billion at the global box office and Avengers Infinity War, which grossed $2 billion, and eight more of the topped $1 billion each. The superhero blockbuster has become a staple in our culture, with entire theme park lands, conventions, and industries dedicated to pumping out as much merchandise and material they can out of this particular genre. For over a decade, characters like Iron Man, Black Widow, Thor, Loki, and Captain America have been a part of these stories, and we've watched as they've grown and changed with time. However, Hollywood wasn't always so kind to superhero films, and in fact, making one was seen as a huge risk. Though there had been some success in the genre, notably with Tim Burton's Batman, it wouldn't be until the 2000s that superhero movies would become worldwide blockbusters, and it all started with the first X-Men movie in 2000. The movie launched the genre as we know it today. Unfortunately, though, it was helmed by a monster. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first video, welcome. Today we are going to be talking about the case of Brian Singer, the filmmaker who has a long, documented history that tends to be looked over and ignored. In fact, if I were to guess, this video's comment section will likely be filled with people defending Singer in a similar fashion to the comment section of our Kevin Spacey video. But regardless, I feel this video is important as Hollywood and the people who have behaved just like Singer can act with impunity, as long as what they have done isn't talked about. This video heavily references multiple articles from The Atlantic, interviews that Singer has done over the years with the Huffington Post, smaller publications, and many more independent sources. All of the sources that I have used will be linked in the description box down below, and the information has all been fact-checked by myself and a third party, who I paid out of pocket. I also highly recommend taking some time to watch the documentary An Open Secret, which is linked in the description box down below as well. The documentary lightly touches on today's case, but it's one of the best documentaries covering the subject matter, and it's also free to watch on Vimeo. If you like this channel, you will like the documentary. This video was recommended by multiple subscribers and a fair few of our patrons over on Patreon. If you have a video suggestion or a request, feel free to leave it in the comments down below or send us an email at dreading.official at gmail.com. If you like true crime content and you would like to see more on your home feed, consider subscribing and turning on the notification bell. This video has been copyright claimed by a third party because of the footage used within it, which is why I'm incredibly thankful to my patrons. They all allow me to continue to make these videos without fear of demonetization or copyright claims. And if you would like to support the channel, the link is in the description box down below. With all of that said, let us begin. Brian Singer was born September 17, 1965, in New York, New York, and was later adopted to parents Norbert and Grace Singer. Both Norbert and Grace were extremely well-connected people, with Norbert being a high-power corporate executive and Grace being an environmental activist. Brian would be raised in West Windsor Township, New Jersey, and would begin making films at a young age. In an interview with the Huffington Post in 1998, Singer would cite his interest in photography and filmmaking starting at a young age, stating that, quote, My neighbor was a photographer for the high school yearbook, and he was really cool, so I thought it would be cool to be a yearbook photographer. For Brian, photography, film, and later directing felt like a form of therapy and allowed him to exert control over some small part in his life. He would later attest to the fact that he often felt like an outsider in the world both because of the fact that he was adopted into his family and that he was gay. Through his art, he felt he could better reflect the world he wanted to see, instead of the world that he lived in. In an interview he would give in 2003, he would state, I grew up being a horribly awkward kid, a terrible student, and now I find myself as a filmmaker. You feel kind of alone in the world because you're separate from everyone else. Unlike so many other creatives, his parents were incredibly supportive always encouraging his artistic pursuits. 
This was likely because he was not the only creatively minded person in the family. His uncle was Jacques Singer, an established conductor, and his cousins were Mark and Laurie Singer, two well-established actors. His family fostered his creativity and supported his decision to enroll at the School of Visual Arts in New York City to study filming. He later transferred to the University of Southern California School of Cinema Television, and it was there he would begin his career in earnest. While still in school, he would write, direct, and act in a low-budget short film called Lion's Den, starring long-term friend Ethan Hawke. The movie itself has been lost to time, and because of that, multiple fake storylines exist online, with one being particularly apt about Hollywood and how many people in positions of power are predatory. However, according to those who were in it, it was a movie about five college-aged friends reconnecting and discovering their lives at the Lion's Den Diner in Hollywood. As the evening progresses, the strains in their relationships start to become prominent. Midway through the editing process, the project ran out of money. Brian sent the rough draft of the movie to Ethan and Dylan Cussman, who also starred in the film, and they shared it with fellow actor and star of Dead Poets Society, Robert Sean Leonard. Robert fell in love with the film at once and wrote Singer a check for $4,000 to finish the movie, stating that it just needed to be made. Before Singer graduated in 1989, he already had powerful friends and weighty connections in the industry that would inevitably open doors for him. His parents were wealthy, well-connected people, and he was good friends with multiple up-and-coming actors in the area. But to hear him talk about it, he fought his way to the top, tooth and nail. Lion's Den opened doors for Singer as both an actor, director, and writer. It was just up to him what title he actively wanted to pursue. After graduating in 1989, he would go on to team up with his high school friend, Christopher McCary, to write his next movie, Public Access. Like with The Lion's Den, Singer also directed the movie and was able to finish filming in 18 short days. Though the budget for the movie was a small $250,000, it was able to win the Grand Jury Prize at 1993's Sundance Film Festival and put Singer's name on the map as a director. Multiple studios were aware of his directing prowess and clamored to get Brian to work on their next project. Project. With studios giving him nearly free reign to do what he wanted, he once again collaborated with Christopher, this time on the 1995 crime thriller The Usual Suspects, which starred fellow Predator Kevin Spacey. It would be on this production that Singer would be tied to inappropriate behavior on set, although not done by him. As a director and producer, it would fall to Singer to protect the actors and actresses who were working under him. He would be the final line in decision making, and in this case, he opted to let Kevin's negative behaviors slide. According to actor Gabriel Byrne, while filming in 1994, production was halted due to Kevin's repeated inappropriate sexual behavior on set. While the details of what Kevin was specifically doing has not been made public, Spacey had already been in multiple sexual abusive relationships with minors, grooming them to believe that he, an adult, was in love with them and was known to sexually exploit minors. According to Gabriel, the reasoning for the shutdown was not told to the other actors, and when he did hear rumors of inappropriate behavior occurring on set, they were laughed off as, that's just how Kevin is. He stated, I mean, he was kind of a joke in that people would say, oh, well, that's Kevin. And nobody really understood the depth of his predations. It was only years later that we began to understand that filming was closed for a particular reason, and that was because of inappropriate sexual behavior by Spacey. Singer contested Gabriel's summation of events and told TMZ that filming was never shut down and no allegations of inappropriate behavior occurred on set. He claimed that had Kevin acted inappropriately, he would have stepped in and stopped filming and said, I don't know why Byrne said that. It baffles me. I'll ask him when I see him and I do run into him quite often. When the film premiered, it was highly lauded, with many people still listing it as one of the greatest films of all time. It won many awards, including three BAFTAs and Academy Awards, and cemented Singer as an A-list director. However, after such a wild success came a horrendous failure. His film, Apt Pupil, which was based on Stephen King's novella and starred Sir Ian McKellen, was critically panned and viewed as a complete failure but the production of the movie would once again be marred by inappropriate behavior. 
this time by Singer. In the movie, there is a scene that takes place inside a high school locker room and shower, and shows minors completely naked, censored only by steam. The wardrobe department instructed the minor extras that were on set that day to wear skin-colored G-strings to avoid being filmed completely naked. Their guardians were ushered out of the studio for shooting, and it was then that Singer told the minors to strip completely naked for the scene. One of the extras was Devin St. Alvin, who was only 14 at the time. After shooting, he told his parents what had happened and they were immediately uncomfortable with the fact that Brian had filmed their child completely naked in the shower. They filed a suit against him, claiming trauma from the experience, charging the filmmakers with, among other things, infliction of emotional distress, negligence, and invasion of privacy. Shortly after filming, other extras who were involved in the film joined the lawsuit, corroborating Devin's story and stating that Brian had filmed them completely naked and in essence, had produced child porn. This accusation led to an eight-month investigation by the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, who somehow found that there was no cause to file charges, despite nine minors all corroborating with each other's stories. In 2019, when The Atlantic was investigating these claims, they corresponded with multiple people who had been working on the set that day, and none of them denied that the kid actors were made to disrobe. According to the article, one of the crew members later said he thought there had been a screw-up the day of the shoot, that only the adult extras were supposed to have been asked to appear naked, and that somehow the minor and adult extras had been mixed together, which verifies that the children on set were meant to be completely nude, and this did in fact take place. However, the Los Angeles district attorney's office seemed to believe that the claims were nonsense. They dismissed the case due to lack of evidence, and Brian released this statement in response. The claims against me have no merit and nothing happened that day, and that is a fact. From my perspective and the perspective of many people who were there that day, and it also happens to be the district attorney's opinion after a month's long investigation. It's just an unfortunate thing that occurs, I believe, when one is working with a company that has a lot of money. I have never experienced anything like that before, but I have been told by friends who have been in the business a lot longer that I should expect it not be the last time which is a strange thing to say as there are plenty of actors, writers, and directors who haven't been accused of filming minors naked. But in a way, he was right. The allegations wouldn't be the only ones made against him. It should also be clarified that the Los Angeles District Attorney, Police, and General Law Enforcement have been known to hand wave criminal complaints if there are powerful people involved. I plan on covering this much more thoroughly in the future. Years later, Victor Valdovinos would come forward to The Atlantic and stated that when he was 13, working on the set of Apt Pupil, he was molested by Singer. The following is an excerpt from the article by Alex French and Max Potter. In the spring of 1997, when Victor Valdovinos was in 7th grade, he showed up to school one day to find a big-budget film production underway. All around them were tractor trailers, mobile dressing rooms, and people with walkie-talkies behaving as if they owned the place. The movie was Apt Pupil, Singer's first project after his breakthrough, The Usual Suspects. Filming took over Elliott Middle School in Altadena, northeast of Los Angeles. Late one afternoon, after basketball practice, Valdovinos stopped in an empty restroom. While standing at a urinal, he says, he felt the presence behind him. He turned around and saw a bespectacled man in his early 30s who was Brian Singer. He looked Valdovinos over. Valdovinos remembered him saying, You're so good looking. What are you doing tomorrow? Maybe I could have somebody contact you about putting you in this movie. By Valdovinos' account, his experience on the apt pupil set was far more upsetting. After being dropped off by his father one morning, he was directed to the locker room. Shooting was about to begin. He remembers that the locker room had been divided. A screen here and lights over there. A crew member gave him a towel and told him to disrobe completely and wrap the towel around his waist. He was 13 years old. He hadn't even had his first kiss. I'm hanging out, Valdovino says, and all of a sudden, Brian comes in. He goes, hey, how are you? Real cheerful. And I'm like, hi. I can't remember his exact words, but he was kind of just saying, come back here. He kind of directs me. He kind of grabs me. And he takes us to the back area, which was kind of closed off. Like, this is the whole locker room. Valdovinos gestures to suggest the space. They're doing their stuff over there, and I was back here. 
and the towel, with no shirt and no clothes on, sitting on one of the locker room benches. Brian's like, just hang out here, it's going to be all day, don't worry. Singer left and Valdavanos waited for what seemed like hours. Eventually, he says, Singer came back and made small talk. How are you doing? Do you need anything? Every time he had a chance. Three times. He would go back there. He was always touching my chest. Finally, according to Valdavanos, Singer reached through the towel flaps and, quote, grabbed my genitals and started masturbating it. The director also rubbed his front parts on me, Valdavanos alleges. He did it all with a smile. Valdavanos says that Singer told him, You're so good looking, I really want to work with you. I have a nice Ferrari. I'm going to take care of you. Though these claims wouldn't be made public until over a decade later, Singer was seemingly already abusing his power on set, and he would start looking for new ways to abuse minors. Prior to this point in our timeline, the internet had not been a readily accessible thing to the average person. Though today, many people can access the internet at any given moment and look up practically anything at any time here on YouTube. And there was a time when if you wanted to find videos online, you would have to search high and low for them. The internet was the Wild West, with multiple video hosting sites frequently being taken down due to DMC and copyright strikes and people choosing to share some of the worst videos imaginable on a whim. It was under this climate that the Digital Entertainment Network, or DEN, was created. DEN was founded in 1996 by 40-year-old Collins Rector, who ran the company with 17-year-old Disney film star Brock Pierce, and his 24-year-old lover Chad Shackley, who he had met when Shackley was just 16. Den's goal was to deliver episodic video content, basically using the internet as its own television-like network. They believed that by targeting niche groups, they could grow a grassroots fan base, who they could then market to. While the pitch for Den seemed legitimate at the time, we now know that Den served as a front for a number of pedophiles in Hollywood to meet with and sexually assault young boys. In 1999, a lawsuit was filed against Mark Collins' rector. The plaintiff alleged that the entrepreneur had molested him for three years, beginning in 1993, when he was only 13. Following the lawsuit, he, Shackley, and Pierce all resigned from the company, leaving it in the hands of Jim Ritz. At the time, despite the controversy, the company was still seen as incredibly innovative, and by 1999, the company was valued at $58 million, with investors including Walt Disney Television President David Newman, David Geffen, Gary Goddard, and of course, Brian Singer. Singer contributed $30,000 and pledged $20,000 more. His career was still on the rise, with him consistently being placed in charge of multiple projects. Despite the two controversies that had followed his films, they did little to hurt his career. However, it was little more than a front for high-ranking, powerful men in Hollywood to meet, drug, and sexually exploit minors. The following is taken directly from the Atlantic article and is the victim's own accounts as to what happened when they worked for Den. Collins, Rector, and Shackley launched Den from a mansion on Benedict Canyon Drive in Beverly Hills, but around the fall of 1997, they moved the company to a mansion in Encino. It was dubbed the M&C Estate. On paper, Den was indeed a forward-thinking idea, but according to a series of lawsuits, criminal complaints, in a federal investigation, the company's Encino mansion became a party house where teenage boys were allegedly given alcohol and drugs and encouraged to have sex with older men, and in some cases, raped. One early, senior-level DEN employee remembers asking why so many teenage boys were on the payroll and being told that they did computer work. The employee also recalls attending a company party and seeing teenage boys filing into a movie theater in the Encino mansion. The employee tried to go inside but was stopped by a bodyguard who said, kids only. The employee asked a colleague what was going on. He said that he had seen some of it and that it was definitely porn. The kids were all laughing and eating candy, but we were totally not allowed into that room. One night, Andy, now 15, got to talking with Singer, who led him away from the other men in the living room of the Benedict Canyon mansion and up a flight of stairs. First room on the right, top of the stairs. Andy says definitely, as if making the walk all over again. His description of the mansion matches its layout, based on the photos that were posted online when it was for sale. Inside was a waterbed. He says he and Singer had talked about what grade he was in. 
Brian knew I was 15, he says, Singer would have been around 31. As Andy tells it, he and Singer weren't alone in the bedroom. Singer had brought along Brad Renfro, the star of Apt Pupil, who was now 15. According to two sources, Singer sometimes referred to Renfro as his boyfriend. Renfro sat sheepishly next to the waterbed, looking unsure of what to do while Singer and Andy fooled around. Clothes came off, but Renfro didn't move. I remember wanting Brad to join in, Andy says. I don't think Brad was gay or even bi. I think he was going with the flow. We talked about it. Like me, he looked around at all the things these guys had. All the money. Maybe he thought the guys were going to do things for him. Renfro died of a drug overdose in 2008 at the age of 25. Andy says Renfro left the room, and Andy had sex with Singer. I just remember how loud the moaning was. I remember thinking, God, there's a big group of people downstairs hanging out in the living room and they can probably hear him. That bothered me, so I stuck my hand over his mouth or in his mouth just to stop it. We went downstairs and it was really awkward. I just acted like it was no big thing. Andy says he slept with Singer a handful of times after that. One night around 1999, he met up with Singer in Las Vegas. They took a long walk. I showed him where all the gay bars were, Andy recalls. It was awkward. He had another boy or two with him and had no interest in me. Andy wasn't the only person to sleep with Singer at a den party. Another minor, identified only by the name Eric, spoke about his time working for den and being sexually assaulted by Singer in the article stating, He first met Singer at a party at the director's place on Butler Avenue. The apt pupil controversy was then big news in Hollywood. According to Eric, Singer mocked the lawsuits. He imitated a Southern lawyer. Mr. Singer, please tell the court exactly, did you or did you not put your hands on that boy? Mr. Singer answered the question. Later that evening, Eric says, he and Singer got to flirting in the hot tub. Just so you know, I'm 31, Singer says. Just so you know, I'm 17, Eric responded. He says they had sex that night. Over the following weeks, Eric says he hooked up with Singer a few more times, at Singer's place and at the MNC estate. Eric understood that he had no purchase on Singer. The director, he says, had people who brought him other boys just like Eric. If you weren't young and cute enough to be their boy, you could still ingratiate yourself by bringing boys to them, he says. That's how I met Brian. And that's how I wound up at the dentist state, people trying to ingratiate themselves. Eric says he and Singer had sex on and off for about five years, into Eric's 20s, when Singer's interest waned. However, Den would implode the week following the premiere of the first X-Men movie in 2000. Actor Alexander Burton, who starred as John Allardyce in the movie, filed a suit against the Digital Entertainment Network, claiming that the founders had offered them jobs, then sexually and physically assaulted them often drugging them prior. This, of course, destroyed Alex's career and led to him being blacklisted in the industry. This instance is similar to how Victor Salva's career remained unaffected by his prison sentence for assaulting a child on his set, but the child's career was stalled completely, and he was later sued by Francis Ford Coppola. Alex was joined by two other accusers in the lawsuit, that being Mark Ryan and Michael Egan. The lawsuit was eventually settled confidentially. However, the results were then leaked. It was revealed by BuzzFeed that the three accusers were awarded $2 million in a judgment and another $1 million in accrued interest. The settlement established that the accusations leveled against those who attended the den parties were, at the very least, in the vicinity of predators. When the photos were circulated showing these parties, the predatory nature of what was going on was obvious. Dan Charon, the attorney who represented the claimants, stated that those who attended these parties and the investors of Den were all aware of the abuse going on, and in fact, poured money into the company to use it as a brothel. He was quoted by Radar Online saying, Some of the investors received, in addition to their stock, a piece of male brothel for their money. Anyone who had dinner at the estate or went to a party there had to know what was going on. Despite being an active investor into Den, co-hosting multiple parties and being previously accused of inappropriate behavior with his child stars, this lawsuit did little to hurt Singer or the X-Men box office. Though he was a hugely successful Hollywood director, outside of the parties he threw, he kept a relatively low profile, which allowed him to avoid being linked to the scandal outright. 
With every movie and professional milestone, Singer had been caught up in a scandal of his own making, but each time, he had also emerged unscathed. He was beginning to feel untouchable in the industry, and as such, he continued to prey on those around him. After the fall of Den, Brian began to garner a reputation in the Los Angeles gay scene, particularly with young men, for his drug use, partying, and predatory behavior. Multiple men have come forward, not with their own experiences, but with secondhand knowledge of what it was like in the scene. In the article, Brian Singer's Obsession with Barely Legal Boys was an open secret by Jordan Sargent. A man by the name of Michael Kay gave his own testimony, stating, I first heard about Brian Singer's infamous Coke and Twink pool parties when I was 18 and was at some party in Orange County that a bunch of dancers from Disneyland were at. One of the Twink dancers bragged to me and my friends about how the weekend before he was at a party in LA that the director of Usual Suspects was at, and the white Twinks, Coke, and meth were falling from the sky. The Twink dancer said that Brian Singer and his fancy Hollywood friends would throw parties like that, and when I asked him to take me to the next one, Bitch said, uh, you're not white, skinny, and cute enough, though. This testimony can also be backed up by the 2009 Queerty article documenting a pool party co-hosted by the director, which ended with this sentiment. And sorry, no photos of the after-after party, which generally has a clothing optional policy, nor do we have pictures of what happened when Ronald and Brian, pictured page 3, took a few select young men into the house for private casting sessions. This yeah. thing also happens to you when you move to L.A. and are a gay man. I moved here like 10 years ago, and I feel like, I mean, these people are obviously still around, but you always hear like, oh my God, I used to be at Brian Singer's parties, and it's never with an air of like... And you should have been there. It was, <laughs> it was, it was always an air of like, what was I doing there? Right. What was that? You know. So it's, it's he's there's it like an air were, of spookiness around him just anyway. It's like you were in a pool party in a nightmare on Elm Street, just uh, right? People yes. being slashed left and right. Um, I. In their own investigation into the claims against Brian, the Hollywood Reporter would go on to write, "Brian's always had a reputation of being with guys that look young." says a high-level studio executive who oversaw one of the director's big comic book movies. Whether they were underage or not, I have no idea. But for 20 years, he's had young guys around him, whether they're assistants or friends. However they were described to you, they were always around. Come on, that's a time-honored tradition in this town, says a producer long acquainted with Singer. Singer's career was still on the rise, with the success of the first X-Men movie leading him to being put at the helm of the entire franchise, as well as directing the Superman Returns film. No one in the industry seemed to mind that he was constantly surrounded by minors, often hiring them to hang out with him while on set. What the studios did mind was his increased drug use. According to studio executives and many actors who worked on his sets, Singer was struggling with his own personal demons during this time, and would often be too sedated to work. In 2002, production on X-Men 2 was delayed for a day because producers determined that Singer had taken too many painkillers to do his job. Then later in 2005, while he was directing Superman Returns, Singer again appeared to be heavily medicated, and he failed to show up on set often enough that an executive producer camped out at the Australian location to ensure that Singer completed the film. With his increased drug use and powerful connections, Singer was unstoppable and continued to throw lavish parties with young gay men. Singer's parties became infamous, with many likening them to parties thrown at the Playboy Mansion, albeit with minors. In an interview with BuzzFeed, a gay screenwriter talked about his personal experience going to one of Brian's parties, stating, It started at like 1am. It was super crowded. Someone told me to stick around as late as I could because after most of the guests leave, the scene in the pool gets freaky. There were a lot of twinks inside, just hanging out and all of them were white. I wandered into what seemed like a screenwriting room or a TV room. There was a PlayStation set up, and a blonde twink in a tank top, who looked maybe 16, was sitting alone on the floor eating fried chicken straight from a KFC bucket. Most white twinks showed up. I felt old and gross, so I left. Brian and some of the other adults who are photographed attending these parties frequently 
would try to state that these parties were simply small get-togethers with a few buddies, and were simply being overblown by a largely homophobic tabloid press. Recording artist and actor Jason Dotley, who by his own admission attended these parties for three years, told the Daily Beast they were not large parties, 20 or 30 people max, very chill, very relaxed. I never saw anyone doing drugs openly, and there was usually a bartender making drinks. I remember a hot tub that could have held like 20 people. It felt like any kind of Friday night hangout, honestly. Despite his defense of the director and his parties, he would also attest to the fact that Brian Singer had a preference for younger men. In the same Daily Beast article, he stated, Everyone knew Brian Singer liked his boys younger. The age range was really tight between 18 and 21. We'd all joke about aging out of Brian Singer's parties. He had a very narrow window. If they were underage, they were acting like they weren't. Jason's version of events would later be called into question when the co-host of many of those parties, Ronald Emmerich, would state that he felt the parties got out of hand. The following is an excerpt from his 2011 interview with The Advocate. Still, within Los Angeles' gay community, Emmerich is well known for hosting boy parties that attract hundreds, even more than a thousand, he says. Scantily clad twinks, his word, to do God knows what in and around his pool. But Emmerich has sworn off what had become an annual Pride weekend pool party that he co-hosted with his longtime friend Brian Singer, director of X-Men and X-Men 2. That got out of hand, says the filmmaker leaning forward on his living room couch to take another sip of an espresso. Four or five years ago, I kind of proposed to Brian that it should be no more than 400 people. You know what Brian said? You want to make it that exclusive. I said, are you kidding me? But then I kind of realized when Singer makes a New Year's party, there's like 600 or 700 twinks running around, and he's hiding in his room. That's quite typical. Emmerich estimates that the last party they hosted in 2009 drew 1,200 guests. I don't know anybody anymore because all my friends said, oh fuck it, I'm leaving. I said no more. This is becoming a circuit party. Indeed, photos on gay blogs make the whole thing look like the prelude to an orgy. But Emmerich states that whatever happened, he didn't partake. We had security and I said, I'm going to bed now, just throw them all out. Blogs and forums were filled with young men discussing things they had seen and been a part of in Singer's presence. Whenever his name was brought up in discussion, inevitably, someone would chime in about how they had seen him with a young boy or promising young actor. But these claims were often hand-waved as nothing more than speculation. That is, until 2014. In 2014, Michael Egan filed a civil lawsuit against Brian, citing that on August 1st, 1999 and October 31st, 1999, when he was 17, Singer flew him to Kailua, Hawaii, and assaulted him. Singer flew the 17-year-old out under the guise of discussing movie roles with him, but each time, Brian fed him drugs and alcohol, then sexually assaulted him. The lawsuit claimed that Egan had been abused and sexually exploited at the Den Estate in Encino since he was 15 years old, and that it was through Den that he met the established director and producer. Egan went on to say that he met Singer when Collins Rector passed the 15-year-old to him during a sex act, and after that, the two continued to have sex. The following is Egan's testimony, as seen in the Atlantic article. One night after a long walk alone, according to the suit against Singer, Egan came across Singer in the pool area. Singer was angry that Egan had gone missing. He allegedly gave Egan a drink that, quote, impacted his motor skills. Egan claimed that Singer laid him down on a lounge chair and spit on Egan's buttocks, spanked him, and forced a handful of cocaine onto Egan's face. He then anally raped Egan. Egan alleged that Singer raped him multiple times on that particular trip and that three other defendants, Gary Goddard, an amusement park designer and den investor, Garth Ancier, a television executive who had also invested in den, and David Newman, who had left his job as president of Walt Disney Television to become president of den, committed similar acts on him in Hawaii. However, there were flaws in this case from the beginning, flaws that would cause any court case to fall apart. The story was filled with one major inconsistency, that being the day Egan alleged the assaults took place. 
all the men accused provided evidence they had not been in Hawaii on the dates in question, and stated full-heartedly that the lawsuit was nothing more than an attempt at a shakedown by a malicious actor. Oddly enough, David Newman, who was the president of Walt Disney Television, provided the court with a statement he had obtained from Egan 11 years earlier, which read, I have never been in any hot tub or swimming pool at all at any time or any place with David Newman. I have never seen David Newman naked, and he has never seen me naked, which seems like a totally not suspicious thing to have, because nothing says I didn't do this very specific crime like having a person make a statement that details a very specific crime you didn't do to them, then hanging on to that for years just in case. And other mitigating factors, Egan's attorney dropped him as a client two months after the suit was filed. Three months later, Egan would voluntarily dismiss his claim. And in a strange twist, his attorneys would make a public apology to Garth Ancier and David, I have a recording of you swearing you never saw my penis Newman. The first apology read, I sincerely apologize for bringing lawsuits against you on behalf of my former client, Michael Egan. As you know, I withdrew from representing Mr. Egan two months after filing the complaints. Based on what I know now, I believe that I participated in making what I now know to be untrue and provably false allegations against you. Had I known what I learned after filing the lawsuits, I never would have filed these claims against you. I deeply regret the pain suffering and damage the lawsuit and publicity have caused you and your family, friends, and colleagues. I sincerely regret my role in this matter and for the harm that I caused. I have resolved this matter with compensation to you. I am hopeful that you can fully recover. I sincerely apologize to David Newman for my part in bringing a lawsuit against him on behalf of my former client, Michael Egan. Unfortunately, I now do not believe that the allegations in the lawsuit were true and accurate. I deeply regret the unjustified pain, suffering, and significant damage the lawsuit and publicity has caused Mr. Newman and his family, friends, and colleagues. This turn of events is incredibly irregular, as most lawyers never make public comments about their clients or ex-clients in this manner, as it's exceedingly bad for business. Even if a lawyer quits or leaves their client, making a public statement in this manner, throwing them under the bus, is seen as a career-ending move. The fact that they did this at all is beyond strange, and has led many online to believe that they were pressured to denounce and discredit their own client by the high-powered individuals they went up against. They both had money and resources to potentially pressure these lawyers into doing this, and this tactic was said to be used by Harvey Weinstein. Egan would later be charged with wire fraud in connection to a Ponzi scheme, and the media would label his claims as nothing but malicious, ill-intentioned lies meant only to gain profit. The lawyers for the accused would put out multiple press releases, condemning Michael, stating that his later crimes were proof that he was a bad faith actor from the beginning, entirely incredible, and that they had been redeemed fully. But that doesn't quite ring true either. Though aspects of his claims do not hold up to peer review, Michael Egan had been sexually abused and had proven as much in the 2000 court case against the founders of DEN. Each of the men he had accused in 2014 had been affiliated with DEN and had interacted with Michael when he was underage and being abused by multiple high-powered men. David Newman even had a handy-dandy statement from Michael detailing how he was not abused in very specific ways by David, something that you would only do if you had been abused by that person in that very specific way. DEN had already been outed as an underage sex ring and these men had already admitted to being involved with the company. So it's not far-fetched to say that these men he accused had abused him, although not on the dates in question. But this is far from the only claim to be made about Singer in 2014. In May of 2014, a month after the claim by Michael Egan was made public, another miner came forward and claimed that he'd been assaulted by Singer, as well as Gary Goddard. The boy, known only as John Doe 117, claimed that when he was 14 years old in 2003, Gary Goddard, another producer and director, began talking to him via social media. Gary groomed the young boy and told him that he knew people who could help him become a star, 
and that included Brian Singer, amongst those who would be willing to help him. The conversations quickly became sexual between them, with Goddard asking for pictures of the minor frequently. Later, according to court records, John Doe stated that Goddard introduced him to Singer over the phone, and it was clear that Singer knew about the relationship between the minor and Gary. In 2006, when John Doe was 17, Singer and Goddard traveled to London for the Superman Returns premiere and asked to meet him there. Singer and Goddard invited the plaintiff into Singer's suite on the pretext of showing him Superman memorabilia, but instead, the two began grabbing the boy and making sexual advances. He rebuffed them, but when it was clear that he was unwilling to do what Goddard wanted, he asked a security guard to rough him up. According to the suit, afterwards, Singer then forced him to have sex with him. Two months after the suit was filed, Singer was dropped from the case entirely. And three months after that, the case would be dropped entirely, which is the exact same time frame as the original suit. Much like Singer and every other person who took part in the Den parties, Goddard would go on to continue to be accused of sexually abusing children throughout his career. On November 24th, 2014, the documentary An Open Secret premiered and immediately made waves. The documentary shed a light on the culture of sexual abuse in Hollywood particularly towards minors. The documentary showcased five former child actors discussing the abuse they had gone through and shed a light on how managers, agents, casting directors, and other people in the industry methodically groom minors into feeling as if they have no other choice but to do as they say. Various different agents and actors who abused minors were put on display, with one agent being interviewed for the documentary later admitting on a phone call that he too sexually abused his minor clients. It's a fantastic, if not entirely devastating watch, and I highly recommend watching it if you haven't already. Brian is featured heavily in the movie, though no direct claims were made against him and none of his former allegations were presented. Brian's intense involvement with Den and how the site was used to recruit and sexually abuse young boys was placed on full display. Many who were present at the time discussed how the Den house, which Brian would frequent, was constantly filled with drugs, and if you lived there, you were forced to obey the rules, like, if you wanted to use the pool after six, you have to swim naked. Though the movie got tremendous reviews and people were shocked at how normalized child predators were in the Hollywood industrial complex, because of its subject matter, absolutely no company would distribute the movie. According to Gabe Hoffman, the producer, we got zero Hollywood offers to distribute the film, not even one, literally no offers for any price whatsoever. This of course is likely because distributing a movie would make people more aware of the problem, which is the exact opposite of what people in Hollywood want. But this would spell the beginning of the end for Singer. Shortly thereafter, Singer reportedly left the production of X-Men Apocalypse, walking off set and never returning. He was quickly replaced, and while it seemed he might possibly face consequences for his actions, he was then hired to direct the Queen biopic Bohemian Rhapsody. And like every other production Singer had been a part of since The Usual Suspects, he created a toxic and unhealthy work environment. Production was shut down multiple times due to Singer deciding to simply not come to work. He clashed with the lead actor, Remy Malek, multiple times, and like before, he was clearly abusing drugs while working. While filming on October 31st, 20th Century Fox terminated their deal with his production studio, which had been in place for over a decade. With the dawn of the Me Too era, people were talking about Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, R. Kelly, and other powerful people who were known to have abused their power and influence in Hollywood. Various actors and actresses made references to Singer, mentioning how he had been known to throw parties with the express purpose of assaulting minors, but for the most part, he remained untouched. That is, until November 1st, a day after his contract wasn't renewed. That day, a Twitter user by the name Justin Smith would come forward and make another claim against Brian. The following is the Twitter thread as it was posted. I first met hashtag Brian Singer in 2000. My boyfriend was one of his best friends, so I had many interactions with him. From the first time I met him, he was always on something. He also constantly hit on me, always asking me to show him my dick or ass. 
when I'd tell my boyfriend about this, he'd say, oh, Brian just gets playful when he's high, but we stopped dropping by his house at my insistence. We would still bump into him at parties. He almost always had a posse. This was always him. Two to three older, 50 to 70 year old men who were obviously on drugs, but still wearing their dress shirts and pants. He introduced them as producers, and at least five to sometimes 10 young men. I should really say boys. None of them could have been older than 16 or 17. They were all aspiring models or actors who were always doped up or naked. Brian always made a point to tell me that they were going to his place for a, quote, private party and asked me to come with them. I said no every time. The same scenario happened five times. Every time, the cast was different. Different gross old producers, different harem of boys. But every time, Brian tried to convince me to join offering me drugs, even offering me a bit part in X-Men 2. One night, I asked him who these old men were, and he said, they have a lot of money. I then asked who all these young guys were, and he said, does it matter, and laughed. And I laughed back. Yes, I hate myself for it. I don't really have an excuse. The same situation had played out so many times, and even though I knew what was happening was awful, I think part of me had resigned myself to the fact that this was Hollywood. Speaking about this was unimaginable then. That same night, in response to all my questions, Brian again asked to see my dick. I said no. He then asked to feel my ass. After hesitating, I relented, thinking he'd give it a quick squeeze, but nope. He quickly and very aggressively shoved his hand down my jeans and underwear and tried to shove a finger inside of me. He had his other hand clamped on my shoulder so I couldn't immediately move away. He penetrated me for a split second before I shoved him away. I said no, I just wanted to go home. He said fine, but I'd better not tell anyone because no one would believe me anyways. I absolutely believed this, so I never said anything until now. I never went to any of Brian Singer's private parties, but I guarantee the stories of the young men who say they were raped are true. I witnessed the beginning of so many of these nights. I wish I would have loudly objected to what I saw happening. I also wish I would have had the courage to speak out when he sexually assaulted me. It didn't benefit me at all to stay silent. All it did was allow myself to become disillusioned and bitter. I hope telling the story helps. Not just me, but anyone else who's struggling. In response to that tweet thread, Singer took down his Twitter account. Then, shockingly, the accuser's account was deleted as well. At the same time, any small or independent outlet that reported on the story would almost immediately take their articles down, which fueled widespread speculation that Singer was threatening outlets with legal action. But still, the allegation spread and was reposted by Jessica Chastain, who had worked with Singer on the X-Men movies. Nine days after the Twitter thread was made, Actor Anthony Edwards accused Gary Goddard of child sexual abuse. Gary, once again, was another investor in Den, and had formerly been accused with Singer of assaulting John Doe. Goddard's name being placed in the news for another sexual abuse scandal only amplified the attention that was on Singer. People who had been vaguely aware of the Twitter thread and Singer's past actions were now inundated with posts discussing how it was possible for Singer to know so many predators without being one himself. Pressure continued to mount until, on December 1st, Brian stopped showing up to set for Bohemian Rhapsody. Much like he had with X-Men Apocalypse, he had opted out of working. His representatives would state that he has to take some time away due to health concerns and a family emergency. However, many who were present knew that to be false. Three days later, Amongst mounting concern and frustration, he was officially fired from the movie, and his longtime publicist stated he no longer was working with the infamous director as well. On December 7, 2017, 32-year-old Cesar Sanchez Guzman filed a civil complaint against Brian, alleging that he assaulted him when he was 17 years old in 2003. According to the complaint, in 2003, a 17-year-old Caesar was invited to a party hosted by Lester Walters, a wealthy tech investor who, like Brian, was known for throwing large parties with young gay men. It was at this yacht party that Caesar met Brian Singer, who plied him with alcohol before offering to take him on a tour of the yacht. But instead of giving him an actual tour, he took him into a small room and closed the door. 
He then, according to the legal documents, forced Caesar down on the ground and shoved his face into his crotch, telling him to perform oral sex on him. Singer pulled out his penis, smacked the 17-year-old in the face with it, and forced it into Caesar's mouth. Caesar told the older producer to stop and tried to end the interaction, but Singer wouldn't take no for an answer. He then pushed the much younger boy onto the bed and continued the assault until he had sexually completed. Afterwards, Brian approached Caesar at a party once more and told him that he was a producer in Hollywood who worked on big movies and that he could help Caesar get into acting as long as he never talked about the incident. He also threatened Caesar, telling him that no one would believe him even if he did speak out and that he could hire people to ruin his reputation should he try to talk about him, which is something that we know high-powered producers in Hollywood have done for years, using Nick Kroll's father, Jules Kroll, and his private investigative firm. In response to the suit, Singer denied that he had ever attended this particular yacht party, and claimed once more that he would be fighting against this narrative until his name was fully cleared. But strange things began to happen. Shortly after the suit had been filed, Sanchez Guzman began to be stalked and harassed at work. His boss noted that he would be followed by multiple different people, and when he eventually approached them, they told him they were private detectives, but made no mention of who they worked for. He claimed he began to get harassing messages at all hours of the day. And then, four months after the lawsuit began, surprisingly, he received notice that he was being investigated by the IRS, and that he and his ex-wife were being investigated by immigration officials. Singer had the ability to pay for high-powered, incredibly well-connected lawyers and private firms that could make Caesar's life hell, as long as the lawsuit persisted, and they did. Caesar was forced back into bankruptcy, with Singer's lawyer fighting that the suit cannot proceed before his bankruptcy proceedings were settled, and fighting for Sanchez Guzman's ex-wife's green card to be revoked. Singer has claimed he had no part in these dealings, that he and his lawyers would never use such means to win a case, but using common sense and basic reasoning, we know that is not the case. But unlike the other men who had dropped their cases and been harassed into silence, Caesar persisted, deciding that even if it cost him everything, he wasn't going to back down from the man who assaulted him. For years, the case persisted, being blocked at every corner by Singer, until finally, in 2019, The Atlantic published their article, Nobody is Going to Believe You, which was an in-depth investigation into Brian Singer's life and the cacophony of sexual abuse claims from minors that had followed him for years. The article was written by Alex French and edited by Maximilian Potter, two men who worked at Esquire, where the article was initially meant to be published. The pair would later write this statement, giving the details into what happened. We have been asked why a story reported and written by two Esquire writers is being published in The Atlantic. The story began with our editors at Esquire. After months of reporting, the story went through Esquire's editorial process, which included fact-checking and vetting by a Hearst attorney, and the story was approved for publication. The story was then killed by Hearst executives. We do not know why. We feel fortunate that The Atlantic decided to work with us, and we are grateful that the piece has gone through the Atlantic's thoughtful editorial process, which included another rigorous fact check and robust legal vetting. We are most grateful that the alleged victims now have a chance to be heard, and we hope the substance of their allegations remains the focus. This was incredibly similar to how almost every article involving the Justin Smith claims that were made via Twitter were subsequently taken down and deleted, but Alex and Max were not deterred and instead went to the Atlantic with the story, and it was published in their March issue of 2019. The article made significant waves and pushed the Sanchez-Guzman lawsuit back into the forefront of people's minds. The article made mention of how Caesar had been harassed since filing the lawsuit and brought up the various other issues he was dealing with from the IRS and immigration, alluding to the fact that Singer and his legal team were likely behind it. In response to the article, Singer released this statement to Business Insider, as well as to his Instagram page. The last time I posted about this subject, Esquire magazine was preparing to publish an article written by a homophobic journalist who has a bizarre obsession with me dating back to 1997. After careful fact-checking and, in consideration of the lack of credible sources, Esquire chose not to publish this piece of vendetta journalism. That didn't stop this writer from selling it to The Atlantic. 
it's sad that The Atlantic would stoop to this low standard of journalistic integrity. Again, I am forced to reiterate that this story rehashes claims of bogus lawsuits filed by a disreputable cast of individuals willing to lie for money and attention. And it is no surprise that, with Bohemian Rhapsody being an award-winning hit, this homophobic smear piece has been conveniently timed to take advantage of its success. So basically, his response was that Alex and Max were just homophobic for accusing him of being a pedophile. This article was made because of that, and nothing that has ever been said about him being a predator has been factual. He just likes to party with children. Three months after the article was published, Singer would end up settling the lawsuit against Caesar by paying $150,000, of which $61,000 would go to his creditors, and the remaining $90,000 would go directly to Caesar. Brian and his lawyers maintained his innocence, claiming that this move was strictly a business decision. He then privated his Instagram and changed the bio to read, the following link is regarding my post from October 15th along with the link to an article from The Hollywood Reporter about how Caesar's lawyer, Jeff Herman, was once accused of rape, as if that invalidates any of the claims from anyone who came forward about Brian himself. Brian had previously stated that he hadn't taken part in any underhanded dealings, like slandering his accusers in the press or harassing them. However, this report being left in the only public social media he has, and it being left there in order to try and negate any claims against him, is telling. In 2021, Blake Sturman came forward and spoke up about the years he had spent in a relationship with Brian. Blake and Brian had dated between 2009 and 13, when Blake was between the ages of 18 and 22, and Singer was between the ages of 43 and 47. For reference, this is what Blake looked like when he was 18. Brian love-bombed the 18-year-old, buying him a variety of expensive items and taking him to different expensive dinners. Blake was on his own for the first time in his life. He could barely afford to sublet a small room in the apartment he was living in. To hear him explain it in the Variety article is overwhelming. Each meal, Brian would say, I'm sitting here, Blake's sitting next to me. The rest of you figure it out. In most of the dinners, Brian would have something in a martini glass. I had never had a sip of alcohol or done any drugs prior to meeting him. One night at dinner, he pressed me on why I didn't drink. Just try it. It's okay. You're safe. I relented and took a sip of his drink. It burned my throat. He insisted I have the rest. He then ordered another. He invited us all back to his hotel suite after dinner. A legendary theater and film actor swung by as the evening grew late. The group left his suite a few at a time until I found myself alone with Brian. I was newly 18, alone in a hotel suite with a rich and famous man who was giving me his full attention, and I was intoxicated for the first time in my life. My chest grows tight now just thinking about it. You can imagine what happened next. I didn't know I was allowed to say no. I didn't know that alcohol was affecting my decision-making ability. He went on to explain being a part of the barrage of young men who Brian kept around himself at all times. Older men would lead groups of twinks, like me, into Brian's house. It was expected that these men had already vetted these boys to make sure they were legal. He would come hang out for a bit, make sure everyone had drinks, and then he'd pick the one, two, or more he liked, and we'd see them an hour or three later. I was often one of them. I wanted to think I was special, different from all the others. I did everything I could to prove myself. I worked hard and secured contract work at various firms and studios. Brian told me I was talented. He was mentoring me. I had been hooked by the promise of working in film. I moved across the country on my own dime at his encouragement. He said it's what I was supposed to be doing. As long as he wasn't hurting anyone, I thought it was okay. I mean, I had been a willing participant, right? I didn't want to be another one of Brian's boys that got used and discarded. I wanted to tell stories. It's what I meant to do. It's what he told me I meant to do. I watched as he could make or break a career on a whim. He could turn his friends into millionaires because he felt like it. It's what he kept promising to do for me. In the fall of 2012, a group of us were sitting in the back patio of Brian's house. It was well after midnight, and Brian had already passed out in his room. On the opposite side of the property, the party was still raging. The thumping bass was relentless. I could never have predicted what would come next. It all happened so fast. I heard loud yelling coming toward me. When I turned, I saw Brian charging towards us angrily. He violently attacked one of the guests near me. 
I grabbed Brian and took him back into the house. His eyes were wild and full of rage. I have never seen him like this before. We went to his room when he slammed the door. I found a shattered lamp on the floor and began picking up the pieces. I'll fucking kill you if you leave me. Those were his exact words. I had never witnessed or experienced physical violence before meeting Brian. I realized I was trapped alone in a room with a violently drunk man. The terror quickly sank in. What had happened? I did my best to calm him down. I chose my words as carefully as I could. Would something I say set him off? I didn't want to find out. The entire article will be linked below in the description, and I highly recommend reading it. As Blake discusses what he witnessed and what he was subjected to, Brian's lawyer responded to the claims, calling the article and the allegations therein uncorroborated, inflammatory, and defamatory. He went further to state that Blake was just another disloyal person who had an axe to grind with Brian, stemming from the fact that Brian never made him famous. Surprisingly, though, Singer's lawyer accidentally validated Blake's claims. In the article, Blake talked about how Brian made him financially reliant upon him. That way, he would be easier to manipulate in the relationship and Brettler provided Variety with text messages showing that occurring. He also showed text messages of their sexual relationship and Brian being sexually demanding to the young boy. Unfortunately, this is where we are today. Singer has seemingly left Hollywood, and is hopefully no longer able to abuse young men any longer. But even if he is away from the industry, there are plenty of men and women in the industry abusing people in the exact same way. If you have made it this far in the video, I highly recommend you go to the description box down below and follow the link to watch the documentary An Open Secret. The documentary sheds a small light on the industry and how men and women who operate within it have normalized sexual abuse of children. It showcases how, from the age of eight, children are encouraged to get emancipated so they can be under their manager's control, and how these managers ingratiate themselves into the children's lives. It's a harrowing look at the real harm that is done to children who work in the industry, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for the conversation about this to continue long after you click off of this video. If there is a case you would like to see us cover, or a subject matter you would like to see us bring more attention to, please leave it in the comments down below, or email me at dreading.official at gmail.com. If you like this video, please consider sharing it, as YouTube does suppress true crime content. And with that, I hope you have a good day, and remember to stay safe.